Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Jurgen Klopp of Apex Slop, Jack Slack. It's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you following another week of bad fights at the Apex. We also had a Bellator champion series, whatever that means, and um, a Ryzen that I haven't watched yet because in the space between the last Ryzen and this one, they launched their own streaming service. Um, so that's another thing I have to get to be able to watch fights. Used to be you could just buy it on Fight TV. But they're a Japanese company and they said, why would we want anyone knowing about the good stuff we're doing? Shut that down. So last week I started by telling you about the Rise card. Oh no, was it the K1 card? The kickboxing card that was the better part of the weekend uh, as a positive start to the episode. So today I'm going to start by telling you something interesting that's going on in combat sports uh, that isn't Apex Slop at the UFC. It's been a while since I mentioned Sumo on the podcast. Those of you who have been around a long time will remember I wrote an article called Sumo and the Art of Six Second Fighting or something like that at Fightland. And then when Katoshu Giku became the first Japanese Rikishi to win uh, a major basho, I wrote another one for him. It's a fascinating sport with an ancient history that is one of those ones that devolves into myth at some point. So at some point there was a real guy who beat a mythical guy because the mythical guy is like nine feet tall. But then there are real people who are documented after that. So um, one of those. But uh, if you've never seen it, it's good fun. Uh, it's brutal in that. Think about how often fights are cancelled due to people getting injured in training. These dudes are training every day, as you would if you're a professional athlete or fighter. And then they have to compete 15 days in a row. And by the end of it, everyone is covered in tape. They are all so injured at the end of every tournament. And there's, is it four or six tournaments a year? It's every other month, so I think it's six tournaments a year. But this lad, Takeru, Takeru Fuji, his first trip to the major basho, his first time as a, uh, you know, in, in the big leagues, as it were, 15 bouts, 13 and two, wins the tournament. First time a debuting wrestler has done that since 1914, which was a lad called Ryo Goku, um, who... <laughs> who went on to never win anything again. It's always interesting looking at these, you go, well, they must have been a superstar. And no, they just had one storming night. And that's one of the wonderful things about sports, and particularly combat sports, is on a given night, someone could just be possessed by the god of war and batter someone they're not supposed to. Or several people. I mean, that's one of the things that I used to love about the tournaments in MMA, uh, when we used to have one-night tournaments, particularly in Japan, you know, there'd they'd be an obvious favourite going into the tournament. And then someone who was regarded as like an okay guy filling a place would just put on three storming fights and win it. I mean, it still happens in the kickboxing K1 and Rise. But yes, jury's out on whether Takeru Fuji ever wins another one again. I think one of the fun, one of the really interesting things about Sumo is, is it is just how good can you do while being injured all the time? The current Yokozuna, there's only one at the moment, that we were in an era of three before, but there's only one at the moment, is Terano Fuji, who is a man mountain. Um, in a sport of gigantic people, he can straight up lift people up and carry them out of the ring. It's incredible. By the, uh, the belt, by the um, washi. But his body's constantly falling apart. So he has to do one basho and then skip two or three because his knees have turned to powder and then come back in and dominate everyone. So I believe he dropped out in the first week of this one. Um, so I was wondering, oh, you know, that'd be interesting to carry Fuji versus Terena Fuji. Uh, but it turns out they're teammates. So they're smacking the shit out of each other every day in the, in the stable. And that brought me back to thinking about something that, um, something interesting about Muay Thai, which I've heard uh, some top guys going over, you know, Falang, uh, foreigners going over to Thailand say, is that the way of training in Thailand biases gyms towards fighters who have the ability to deal with this ridiculous training capacity and not necessarily their best fighters. I mean, you can go and look up the stories about what, what, uh, top gyms do in Thailand, but two training sessions a day and a 10K run is something you see trotted out fairly often, um, which of course is an enormous amount of training. Running 10K a day alone would be enough to turn a lot of people's knees to powder. And while Thailand produces, of course, the best Nagmoy in the world, and the best Nagmoy tend to be the people who excel in these gym environments, at a certain point, all of that aerobic conditioning becomes redundant. Well, not all of it, but you know, at a certain point, 
if you're only fighting a certain number of rounds, a good deal of that extra aerobic conditioning becomes unnecessary or redundant. And of course, there's benefits of like mental toughness added to that, but it, it does raise some interesting questions because that is a training schedule that most like world-class trainers for most sports that have a lot of funding would not be recommending anyone undertake. There's been a lot of work done into sports science and that goes against a lot of it. But yes, just as sumo seems to weed out those who can take the most injury and work through it or work the best while injured, Muay Thai seems to root out the people who have this enormous capacity for work and also don't get injured by it. Both of those far beyond the need of one individual bout or tournament. Anyway, something exciting that happened. Now let's move on to our regularly scheduled Apex Slop. This one was actually pretty rough. It, it had its moments, of course, and we will touch on those, but it's, it's getting kind of tedious that there's eight hours of fights. And you can tell beforehand, most of the time, who's going to be interesting on them. And you go, oh, okay, there's a couple of gems in there, because there's always like a couple, but you're almost never surprised by everything else. So your main event was Rose Nami Yunus versus Amanda Rebus, and Rose Nami Yunus looked a lot worse than most of us were hoping, because... As a strawweight, she was one of the real super talents of women's MMA. Um, very tricky, varied game. Extremely crafty, always setting something up. And as dangerous as a grappler as she was a striker. Coming up in weight, seems like the strength is an issue, which we saw against Manon Furo, because she was shooting these dreadful takedowns and just falling down the leg onto the ankle, basically. And then Manon Furo would kick her leg out and go, right, let's get back to work. Um, also, she just got, I mean, she got popped up with a, a good few counter-right hooks in that fight. She didn't seem that comfortable against a southpaw. But Furo's power seemed considerably greater than Nami Yunus. And Nami Yunus had a decent amount of pop at flyweight, not necessarily... Huge hitter, but a competent hitter. Up here, she seems to just be able to like bounce her fists off people's heads and not really even moving their head. Amanda Rebus, you know, fair play to her. She's done a lot of work to try and improve her striking because it's been something that lets her down uh, ever since like Marina Rodriguez TKO'd her back in, when was that? 2021. Oh, January 2021, right, right at the start of the year. But I thought she was mainly one twos and then the odd spinning back kick or wheel kick or whatever. Um, she still largely is, but she did a good job of trying to counter Nami Yunus here. There was, in fact, even when she got hit, she came back with a counter, and she seemed to have enough power that Nami Yunus was forced to respect it. From the early going, Nami Yunus was... Um, Rebus switches stances, and Nami Yunus would try and get on open stance with her. So if Rebus was orthodox, she'd go southpaw briefly. Or if Rebus was southpaw, she'd go orthodox briefly to make that open stance engagement, and she'd do it in move in motion as she's circling or moving around the cage, change the stance and immediately throw the rear hand. So she try and thread the rear hand down the middle in that open stance engagement. Worked really well for a couple. She hit her in the head and the chest. And then Rebus really impressed me because she got the read on it in the first round. That first duck into the body lock, she sees Nami Yunus change stances and start to bounce in off her back foot. And she immediately ducks under, gets the body lock and trips her to the floor. And I thought, wow, maybe I really have underestimated Amanda Rebus here. And then the rest of the fight was largely dictated by Amanda Rebus attempting bad headlocks, which is just the bane of women's MMA. It's the absolute worst thing about it. When people, and this is the thing, it's bad. You've got people like Dom Cruz on commentary saying it's bad. He asked DC, why does that work in, WM in women's MMA? And DC wasn't allowed to say, because <laughs> like he, he will never say anything that upsets the company. But you still have people out there on the forums going like, uh, saying that this is bad technique overlooks the differences between men and women. Women's center of gravity is lower or higher or whatever it is they say, or they, they've got boobs or <laughs> they've got big hips. And they get, they go, they, people bend over backwards to try and make a reason why a head and arm throw is good in women's MMA. And you're like, even if the throw was easier to hit because of the different center of gravity... 60-70% of the time, when they hit the mat, the person on top gives up their back in a scramble. It's nothing to do with whether they can hoist the opponent over their hips and sling them to the mat. It's once they get there, they're in a crap scarf hold, and then the opponent comes up on their back. And it happens in almost every women's fight in the UFC, sometimes multiple times. There was actually quite a cool one in this fight. I think it was the second or third round. Amanda Rebus tries a headlock throw meets some resistance and then rolls 
and then lets go and rolls through her legs on a knee bar attempt. Uh, failed on the knee bar attempt, and I think Nami Yunus got on top of that too, but it was quite cool. Um, but yeah, imagine if there was any other technique where, let's say, for instance, it's one in three times you try a technique, the opponent gets you back. Why would you do that technique when there are other techniques? And it seems like for a lot of women, it's like a, I've, they've got the underhook in a clinch. I'm going to try this move. Um, there are people who chase after it and they're the ones that really do annoy me. Someone like, um, or Stephanie Egger or someone like that. I mean, Sid, Cindy Dandois, all those people who have judo backgrounds, but actually just want to headlock a bitch. Um, there are people who chase it, but I think even just doing it out of a clinch where you are slightly disadvantaged is a waste because it's worse to end up with the opponent on your back or on top of you than it is to try and fight to get a better position so that they don't get on top of you. If you, you know, if they have the underhook along the cage, they have work to do to get you down. If you step across and try and headlock them to the mat and you fail, you've done the work for them. And it goes back to this criticism that I often have of striking where you get hung up in single engagements and you forget there's the rest of the fight. You know, you're not building from one exchange to the other. You're not building from one exchange to the next. You're not investing in uh, attritive damage to the body or legs to slow them down. Or, you know, you, you're not thinking about further down the line. Everything's for now. It's like, oh, they've got the underhook. I better try the headlock throw. And then you've got two minutes, three minutes on the bottom and you've instantly lost the round. Back kicks with your back to the fence. Valentina Shevchenko style. Spinning kicks when you're not sure where the opponent's going to move, like uh, Uriah Hall versus Rob Whittaker. That's a great example of this exact principle I'm talking about. If you do silly bollocks against good fighters, they, they're not obliged to like step back and, and dap you up and be like, yeah, you almost got me, bro. No, they're going to stick to your back and take the back body lock for the rest of the round. If they can get you down, great. If not, they'll just stay behind you and win the round and then win the fight. Whittaker versus Uriah Hall is, is quite a, um, it didn't make a lot of noise when it happened because it wasn't a very interesting fight. But any time Uriah Hall tried something stupid, Whittaker just stuck to him and won the rest of the round off that one bad decision. Three round fight. How hard is it to hold someone down for a couple of minutes if you get on top of them anyway? Three bad decisions will lose you the fight. I mean, two bad decisions in a three round fight will lose you the fight. This was a five round fight. There were lots of bad decisions, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, that was it. I just, the whole fight was a bit crap. Um, Nama Yunus doesn't seem to have the pop at this weight. She looked slower to my eye and she looked like she'd regressed a bit. It really did. Like once I'd got over that, oh, that's cool. She's changing stances to be on the open side, to be on the open stance and then throwing the rear straight as Rebus walks onto her. Once you'd seen it, you were like, oh, she's really not doing an awful lot else. And then in the later rounds, as she always does, as happened in the second uh, Yun Jacek fight, as happens in any longer fight, she slows down. She comes down off the balls of her feet. She's doing more like moving her head and stuff, but she'll then throw a jab and get low kicked. Fourth and fifth round, Rose Namajunas cannot stop a low kick to save her life. And every time she takes one, it like buckles her leg and sends her flying. Now, she didn't get completely chopped apart in the fourth and fifth round here, but any time that Rebus did slip a jab and throw a low kick, it really messed with Namajunas. Um, so I thought, yeah, Amanda Rebus impressed me with her reads and then depressed me with her wrestling choices. And Nami Yunus just, yeah, it, it really kind of annoys me how, it kind of disappoints me how her career's gone um, when she was so extraordinarily talented. And some people will blame Pat Barry. I've, I said last week, like, any time you've got someone that close to you in your corner, whether it's father, brother, spouse they shouldn't be there for a start because they're supposed to have the objectivity to stop the fight if you're getting injured wouldn't even matter if like pat barry was her main coach the whole time and then they switch and then he sat out and let his second be chief corner um but i think the fact that they moved away from whitman isn't great uh you know a lot of these things i don't know if the split was acrimonious or if they left on good terms but there are a few guys in the sport who are pretty good at improving people's striking mechanics and, and keeping them sharp and teaching them to move. And she could use the help of someone who will channel her creativity into good fights where she wins the majority of exchanges. 
and does enough to win. I mean, that, that was the Carla Esparza one. Pat Barry's in her corner going, if they're booing, we're winning. It's like, I don't think that's true. I think the other thing about like changing coaches like that, because changing coaches is a, is a constant in all fighting sports. But if you end up with a, a kind of unique style and a coach has overseen you for you developing that, that can be real tricky. I mean, I always mention uh, Prince Nazim, but he he was with Brendan Ingle. Brendan Ingle didn't even produce like 10% of the champions and world-class fighters that Emmanuel Stewart did. But when Prince Nazim ended up with Emmanuel Stewart, Emmanuel Stewart didn't know what to do with him. Emmanuel Stewart doesn't teach people to fight from both stances and square and side on. Emmanuel Stewart teaches people to cronk gym box. So falling out with the people who get you there always happens and it almost never works out well. I mean, Tyson Fury fired his coach after successfully beating Wilder, I think it was in the second fight. It's always tricky when you see that percentage cut. And the percentage stays the same, but the number keeps getting bigger. And you're going, is this person worth X hundred thousand? Well, not in MMA. <laughs> oh God, we haven't even talked about the um, fighters settling in the uh, lawsuit, but we'll, get, we'll do that on the boycast for when we want to be really depressed. So let's rebound back to positive things. Good stuff from this card. Peyton Talbot, people said to look out for him. I liked Cameron, I quite liked Cameron Simon, so I was looking forward to this fight anyway, but it's bantamweight, it's two up-and-comers. It, it was probably going to be good. But Peyton Talbot really knocked my socks off. A lot of people after this were like, Cameron Simon fights like Drickus Duplessis, and that doesn't work in the good divisions. I was going, really? Did you not see, like, Peyton Talbot caught a kick and then pushed on the arm and threw a wheel kick out of the kick catch, which was incredibly slick. And then because people were still in awe of how cool that was, they didn't notice Cameron Simon do a switch kick to the body, step back into Southpaw stance, and then back kick to the body as Talbot pursued him, which was also really cool. They were both doing some pretty interesting things in this one. Uh, just Talbot had his number. People told me that Talbot was sort of like a slower O'Malley or something before this fight. And um, the big hair, I can see, and the stance switching... Uh, and the the backs, like, he didn't score any open side counters in this one, but you saw him looking for the opportunity a lot. Any time that they were on open stance and Cameron Simon came in, he'd glide back to his left or, or you know, he'd glide back out to the diagonal, hoping to, th to throw across the top of uh, Cameron Simon overcommitted. There was a really good knee. Um, Talbot did a great job of, kind of like O'Malley when he's really on his game, moving forward, throwing strikes, but always trying to be like ready to counter strike. Uh, it's that offensive counter striking. It's very fatiguing to do, and it's very fatiguing to have done to you. Uh, so it results in lots of finishes because if you can stay in someone's face and put them under pressure, and then when they lash out at you, counter. That's exhausting for them. That's a great chance of you knocking them out clean because they're going to really uh, make mistakes if you keep them under the pressure when they lash out. But equally for you, your brain has got to be switched on because you're walking straight at the guy and inviting strikes back and throwing strikes at him. So you're not staying safe the whole time. It's not like you're just following him in your stance, like Cheeto Vera. But he managed to corner him against the fence and Simon did what a lot of people do on autopilot, immediately level change for a takedown. And Talbot, you know, it's got to be like one of two responses you're expecting there. Uh, hit him with a knee. And it looked like it hit him in the head, but they showed the replay hit him in the neck, in the side of the neck, which of course is where you aim your, your kicks in Muay Thai um, and the old karate chop, because if you hit the carotid artery, good chance the guy just folds. The thing that stood out in the first round that I wrote down in my notes and I was like, big question mark, big excla exclamation mark. And then it happened two times in that round. And then it happened to score the knockout in the, in the second round. Um, rear hand parry. Well, they were both changing stances, but we're talking Talbot's orthodox. And whenever Simon threw his right hand, Talbot would reach across with his right hand and parry the inside of it, which is a very weird thing to do. Normally, if you're doing inside parries, you do it with your lead hand and you throw your rear hand as a straight. So you clear the hand that's in the way of your straight out of the way and you throw your right straight. A large part of that is because when you're inside parrying or cross parrying, you're reaching across yourself with one hand. And anytime you do that, you're opening yourself up to punches on the other side. Because if we, you know, if you if you face someone, you just draw a line down the middle of both of you. Your right hand deals with their left hand. Your left hand deals with their right hand, like you're in a mirror. If you bring your left hand across to slap the inside of their left hand, so when they jab, you use your lead hand to parry the inside of it, you make a nice line for your right hand to get to their chin. 
but you've also opened up that same line on your left side. Now, if you're orthodox, doing it with your left hand makes more sense because your lead shoulder is still there. You can get down behind it. One of Bernard Hopkins' late fights, like when he was in his 40s and still trying to win a world title, actually did win a world title in his 40s, um, he spent most of the fight parrying the opponent's jab with his lead hand and then getting down behind his shoulder when they threw their right straight. It was very impressive. Uh, it made the other guy stop throwing punches was the answer. Like made him very confused and he didn't really do anything. Um, but if you do it with your rear hand, so your right hand comes across to slap away their right hand, whether they're southpaw and they throw a jab or they're orthodox and they throw a right straight, you come across like that. If you're standing orthodox and you use your right hand across your body, you don't have anything protecting you on that side. It's like we talked about in the Filthy Casuals Guide to uh, Sean O'Malley. Go look that up on YouTube. Uh, you know, on the open side, your hand and your reactions are the only thing that protect you. So all that is to say that he was using the inside, he was cut, bringing his right hand across to parry, to cross parry, and then throwing the left hook. And it was working really surprisingly well. But he was also like coming dangerously close to getting hit after it. He was just sort of standing there. Uh, really crazy to watch. Roy Jones used to do it, which should tell you that it is some crazy bullshit. Um, but he landed it three times and the third time he knocked him out or knocked him down and finished with strikes on the ground. I thought this was a, a terrific showing against a decent fighter, uh, and I'm very excited for more Peyton Talbot in my life. Another one that I picked in the uh, boycast to be interesting was Yusuf Zalal versus Billy Quarantilo, because Yusuf Zalal's coming back at short notice. He went out of the UFC on, I think it was three losses and a draw or something like that, but the losses were to good people, and the first one was to Ilya Tapuria, he was always good. He was just dropping these decisions. So he went out of the UFC. He did some boxing and kickboxing and a, and a few MMA fights. And he got the call up on short notice because they knew he was a professional and he'd make weight and stuff. And that, I mean, that's rough for Billy, for Billy Q because that's a good opponent to take at last minute. If you're getting a last minute change of opponents, you ideally want some randomer who's never fought anyone good. But you've also got bills to pay. So uh, unlucky, Billy Q. I thought Zalal pulled a blinder in this one. I thought I just loved his style because Billy Quarantilo is forward movement and pressure and he wants to tie you out, whether that's by throwing lots of punches and making you move or whether that's by tying up and threatening to wrestle you. But he's that constant forward march. And Yusuf Zalal diffused that beautifully. He jabbed and low kicked, both weapons that have a good range and the jab you can keep moving while you're doing. Very non-committal weapon. Low kicks, you know, a little bit more committed, but very long. So he's just snapping away with those. And then when he gets Quarantilo really chasing him, he hits him with an intercepting knee. And the first time I, he did that, I went, nice. And I wrote that down. I was like, oh, that's really nice. I'll come back to that later. You know, he probably won't land another one. But then he just looks for them the whole fight. He's just landing these knees. He hit him on the chin with one, um, which was really impressive. They showed the replay after that. It's kneecap on the point of the chin. And Billy Q takes it. Very impressive. But that was basically the whole fight on the feet and what set up the, the trips too. Zalal was just drawing him forward. He was playing the matador, moving around the ring, jabbing, low kicking, move. When the guy's really committed and coming in on a line, you intercept him. I've got a question about like striking principles later, but that's a big one. Keep the guy following you. Make it about following and not cutting off. If you can get him following you, you've got a real chance of intercepting him with knees, elbows, even punches are much better if the guy's walking onto them. But knees and elbows are weapons that are so short and so dangerous to throw going forward at the guy that, may, you know, if you're going after someone with knees and they're not against the ropes or a fence, that's quite a dangerous thing to do. But if they're coming onto you, you know, they're, they're taking half the space that you'd need to travel through for you. What let Billy Q down on the ground here was that he kept, he'd dig his hand underneath the thigh and start throwing his hips out to the side as if to go up for an arm bar. And then Zalal would pull his arm out. And th this is like what's often called K-guard. You're seeing a lot of guys use it because in grappling, it gets you onto the legs. In MMA, you can get onto the legs and use that to like scramble up or just keep the guy off you while he's, uh, while you're hurt. But you can also start coming up to your knees. You know, you go over your shoulders and up, uh, you roll back over your shoulders and up to your knees. Uh, Kevin Holland did that against, who was that? Uh, but Kevin Holland and Charles Oliveira have done it lots. Greg Jackson used to teach it back in the day. It's, it's quite a common thing to see in MMA. You know, throw up the arm bar. When they pull back, you roll to your knees and you, you stand up. But Billy Q, he went up on his shoulders and he threw his hips out and he was holding underneath the leg and 
Zalal pulled his arm out and then Biddy Q just sort of like sat there and Zalal just popped his hips up and threw the legs past and was past guard. So Billy Q did all the work passing his own guard. And he did that in the first round and then he did it in the second round and both times he ended up giving up his back. But the other cool look in this one was the Zabit trip because he tried it in the first round and I immediately went, oh, didn't work. It's a bit cringe. And then he did it again and he scored it. And then he did it in the second round and that's how the, the ending of the round, uh, the ending of the fight came about. Um, that is another one where if you've got, you're looking for the guy's lead foot and you're trying to do it without taking grips. So the way to do it is to get him stepping forward constantly so that you know roughly when his foot's going to step down and where it's going to land. Technically, a no Sotogari, not the Zabit trip, but Zabit made it famous. Um, though in this fight, Yusuf Zalal probably used it more effectively than Zabit did. As in, like, he he authored a finish off it. I can't remember if Zabit just did it to arse around. Piotr Jan did it a couple of times. I'm always worried about kneecapping someone if I do it in sparring. You know, if you just... If their knee, if their foot's turned in and you just hit the back of their leg, you hit a beautiful sweep and knock their leg out and everyone goes, oh, what a huge dick he must have. But if you just go into the side of their knee and crunch it, that's you know, a great way to lose friends. So yeah, really happy for Yusuf Zalal. I don't know if he's going, you know, I, I'm not going to say he's like back and better than ever. He's not Eric Bischoff. Um, but he looked really good in this matchup and he, he had a real good plan. And of course, he was never really a finisher before. Um, so that's really good for him here too. Anything else interesting? I thought Pawele. Pa wait, hang on. What's it? How's this guy's name said? I'll be honest. I muted the commentary for most of this card, and then uh, Jamie Varner's going off about how much he hates Laura Sanko's commentary. And I'm like, she did. Did she say something really silly? Because she's normally the voice of reason, being like, "I've watched his fights, and this is what he does." <laughs> and then DC's like, uh, "I had a fantastic sandwich on the way here. This is a great city." But anyway, anyway, Lewis. Pajuelo versus Fernando Padilla or Padilla. Um, these guys were having a good, interesting scrap. And as Padilla was circling the cage, he was getting too close to the cage for my liking. Pajuelo throws a good right hand to the body as Padilla is moving into it, which we love herding punches. You, you hit them from the side they're circling to, which stands them still so you can throw a couple more punches. So it gets off a combination that way. And I went, nice, this guy, he knows how to cut the ring. Meanwhile, Padilla's looking for teeps off his back leg. Really nice. Pahuelia corners him again. And I'm going, oh, this ring cutting's fantastic. And then <laughs> he loads up on the biggest left hook you've ever seen to the body. And he drops his right hand down to his crotch, it seemed, as he threw it. So he, let, he throws a huge left hook to get hit by a smaller left hook on the jaw and gets stunned. And then he gets dropped and finished with the dars. Um, You know, I don't... In MMA, we had to be really careful about being like, you got to have your hands up at all times. You've got to always have your right hand up when you're throwing your left hand and your left hand up when you're throwing your right hand. When really, like, there's so many other things. You can move your fucking head. You can fall into clinches. There's so many things you can be doing that are defensive considerations that aren't just hold your other hand up. Because that is not a great defensive instinct to foster. Be like, rely on your hand being there. Because especially when you're in smaller gloves, there's so much room for punches to slip behind and in front of it. But... If you are left hooking, you have always got to expect the opponent's left hook to be coming back because it's like having a knife and they've got a knife and you're going, right, I'm going to go up and stab that guy. Of course, he's going to be stabbing back. You are both in knife range. So the way that he went in for this, he was like, right, I've got him now. He did a full Looney Tunes YI order wind up. And the guy who threw the left hook shorter got there first. I don't even, you know, I, I didn't even look if Padilla's right hand was up guarding him. Didn't matter. <laughs> it was project it was Pahelios that got him in trouble. Anything else on that card? Julian Arosa versus Ricardo Ramos. That was another one I said I was looking forward to. That's two of my boys. Um, Juicy J, really fun but terrible chin. And he he fights moving forward with his hands down too. So he's just a liability. I'm always watching him going, Well, he could change his style and be really good, but this is fun. <laughs> and Ricardo Ramos, I said, you know, oh, he's gonna look for the spinning elbow because that's his meme technique. But uh, he's generally a pretty good all-rounder. And Ramos dropped him early. And then he tried a body jab into a spinning elbow. And then he tried to take down and he picked him up and he got guillotined. I don't even know why he was trying to take him down. He, he was doing really well on the feet and he dropped him. But uh, that's Ricardo Ramos. He's always going to be better than his record tells you he is. Look back in five years' time and... When people are looking for, like, good fighters who never really got recognised as good fighters, Ricardo Ramos is probably going to be one of them. 
And then I suppose the other one we should really touch on is the bite. Um, this was so weird. Andre Lima versus Igor Severino. It's it's so weird to me because, like, the time to do it was so strange. You know, the famous one is uh, Mike Tyson versus Evander Holyfield. Evander Holyfield, you know, there is no excuse for biting someone, but Mike Tyson was headbutted like a dozen times in that fight, and it was making a big difference to the fight because, you know, Mike Tyson has to get in and throw uh, throw in combination, and if every time you come in, the other guy sticks his head underneath yours and lets you run onto it. That's problematic. So he got angry about the ref not calling that, and he bit him. But Mike Tyson's a huge pay-per-view star. This guy was here in his first fight in the UFC, having come off the Contender Series. He got a knockout on the Contender Series. I'm sure people were excited to see him. I don't watch the Contender Series. I had no idea who he was. But you're still a dude on the undercard, and he didn't even do it subtly. I think uh, Lima was grabbing the cage to prevent takedowns or something like that. But... It didn't seem flagrant enough to get that upset about. It seemed like he was just being a dick. And it was from such a weird position to do it too. And Chris Doyle only took a while breaking them up and he seemed a bit confused and stuff. But the way that he reacted, I think, was actually pretty good. It was like there was no, you know, oh, warning for biting. Because that's the thing that pisses me off about like illegal, stri- well, eye pokes and all that shit. It's always like, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that you did that by accident. There's no possible way you can do that with biting. And, um, you know, if you're the opponent, you've got to be like, because he's, Toyoni's out talking to the commissioner and stuff, and you've got to, he's desperately trying to get them to look at the bite marks, because obviously they might fade after a while, so you've got to get the guy looking at your bite marks now. But, uh, man, what a manky motherfucker Severino is. And the, the sad thing is that they were having a decent fight. They, they both looked like they knew enough of what they were doing, and they were both looking for openings and creating openings, and... He was doing decently in the grappling. I have no idea why he just like lost his mind and bit the dude on the arm. I now want to go back and watch this guy's fights to just see if he's a massive cheater. Because if you can cheat and get away with it in all your fights, that's quite impressive. You know, Fritzy Zivix, the mysterious Billy Wells is of the world. Uh, people like that, Kid McCoy. Anyone who made an art out of cheating, that's quite clever. But this was just like, why, bro? What did you get out of it? You didn't distract him and then suplex him. You just bit him and then he went, ow. <laughs> it's not like low-blowing someone on the opposite side of the ref so that they look across to the ref and then you hit him in the chin, like Jack Dempsey versus Jack Sharkey. Or Tyson used to elbow people on the side of the clinch that the referee wasn't on. I think he did that to Burbick. But yeah, what a fucking dork. Um, other stuff this weekend, Bellator Champions Champion Series was, oh, yeah, it was okay. It was an island card. They got all their Irish favourites on, you know, it's just, well, Belfast, Northern Ireland, but they got all the SBGI lads that they normally have on. Uh, main event was Corey Anderson versus Carl Moore. Carl Moore, not bad. Corey Anderson, obviously, long-time UFC vet. Kind of unfortunate because his best performance is probably when he was slapping the crap out of Vadim Nemkov in their first fight, about to take the title, and then an, an accidental clash of heads opens him up. However, in this fight, he's pretty deliberately headbutting more from the same position. So I don't know if it was accidental. But in that fight, he accidentally opened his own head up with a headbutt in the third round, having won two of the rounds quite convincingly. And um, rather than have a technical decision, they went to no, they went no contest, which is really unfortunate because they I think they'd done. Oh no, they had to have like seven more seconds to have the whole fight, you know, to do a technical decision on the majority of the fight having happened. But in the rematch, Nemkov just had his number. Um, so, yeah, kind of sad for Corey Anderson in that way. But here he got his belt at last by fighting Carl Moore, who really hadn't done anything amazing. Um, the, the main thing was that the Irish fans were cheering for Moore like wild. And then about round two, when they realised he wasn't going to do it, they just started leaving, which was really sad. Because at the end of round four, Carl Moore gets off the mat. They do a pan of the arena where half the seats are empty. They pan to the cage. Carl Moore's like trying to hype up the crowd and go, I'm still here. You know, he got arms out, puffed out chest going, yeah. And there's, you know, half the people have already gone home. <laughs> it's really sad. Uh, I mean, fuck that crowd mainly. Like, you know, if you want to bandwagon the Irish MMA thing and then just abandon your main event fighter because he's down a couple of rounds. Imagine if people did that with Leon Edwards, even though that was in Utah. Uh, but Leon Edwards, Kamaru Usman too. 
Be like, did you see that amazing finish to Leon Edwards, Carl Kamaru Usman? Oh, no, I left in the third round. Sorry. Had to get the train. But nothing really interesting happened in that fight. Uh, Carl Moore was sort of let down by backing himself onto the cage constantly. His right foot was just wedged in the cage, and he'd throw like a big uppercut from there, but he'd just get clinched up and taken down anyway. Did stun Corey Anderson in the first round, though, with a good left hand and then a left high kick. Patricio Pitbull kind of returned to form, fighting back up at featherweight. Absolutely dwarfed by Jeremy by Jeremy Kennedy, as expected. But, um, yeah, I mean, he didn't really take any big shots, but he looked fine with them. Uh, he spent most of the fight low-kicking and uh, body jabbing, trying to get Kennedy to throw back so he could throw across the top with the right hand. Except he didn't. He didn't ever, like, unleash the right hand until he got hurt in the third round. And then he went, oh, okay, right now I've got to do something. Uh, and then he just knocked him out. He just decided to knock him out. But then a lot of Pitbull's fights have been like that. He's a very sort of weird, low-activity fighter who can then just end your whole night in one punch. I think he's probably, yeah, I mean, I think he's definitely lost a step at this point, but he's had an interesting career, even though most of it has been calling out whoever's the UFC champ and then being like, we should cross-promote, even though that's never going to happen. And then James Gallagher lost to Leandro Higa, Higo rather, in a fight where James Gallagher did the... What I'm kind of used to now from Straight from Last Gym guys is when their wrestling doesn't work, they stand on the feet and you can almost see them thinking, what do I do again? What am I good at? What's our gym's thing? Because their striking is generally quite meat and potatoes. And a lot of them are quite good on the ground, but they don't really have the wrestling to get really good grapplers there. But anyway, it was a mid-event, but at least it was something going on that wasn't just at the apex. It's quite nice to see a stadium full of people cheering. That'll do us for this week. I'll be back on the boycast talking about fun stuff and answering questions and all that stuff. If you want to get in on the boycasts and all the extra stuff I do for the boys, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. More women's flyweight main event next week. Bless. <laughs>